here's the question. Do I listen? Now, despite the protestations of my father to the contrary when I was growing up, I thought the answer was pretty obvious. Yeah, I listen. But I had these two conversations with these two very different men that challenged my notions about listening and changed my life. Now we have story time. So for the first uh, story, the thing you need to know about me is that I tend to work late. I read late, I, I like to do things late. So, it wasn't a surprise at a job that I had before I left to start this consulting company that I was working late. Also, not a surprise, that the janitor, who was then this lanky Hoosier dude named Red, was waiting for me to finish up for the night so he could come and clean my office and get on to the next piece of business. He'd poke his head in my office and you know, just kind of check my progress. And I would say, oh, Red, just give me two more minutes. Always a lie. <laughs> he never believed it. But what he'd do instead is he'd grab a soda from his lunchbox and sit in my office guest chair and shoot the breeze with me about news, weather, and sports. Now, when I say sports, I mean sport and specifically Indiana University basketball. <laughs> he, yes, he knew I went to Purdue and he was just rubbing my rhubarb, exclaiming about the value and the majesty of IU. Oh God. So, <laughs> but he was fine enough company while I was finishing up for the night. One day, though, the topic turned to this diversity program that I was putting together and was going to be leading. He said, there's been talk. Okay. He said, you know, there's been talk that this program is just simply going to be essentially a rehash of everything white people had ever done bad at this company. He was really worried that white men were going to get picked on. Then he said, well, did you realize that the Klan has taken an interest in your program? I had. It was semi-rural Indiana. <sighs> then he said, well, did you realize I'm a Klansman? Yeah and my perspective of him changed radically. He went from being this jolly, jovial janitor to a threat, and I went from a college-educated, Purdue, of course, business casual clad professional to the great-granddaughter of the apartheid-era South. I got polite. <laughs> he tried to explain to me, get this, that the Klan was really formed, not out of any real malice towards black people, but to protect Southerners from carpetbaggers after the Civil War. Now, this is the mid-90s, and I'm thinking, when the Civil War was, I think, yeah. I tried to reassure him that the program was being designed to be balanced, and that I'd take feedback from anybody once they'd sign up and, and take the program. And he promised to be among the first volunteers, and he was good to his word. I think he was satisfied with this at this point, or it might have been the fact that I stood up and slung my purse over my shoulder, maybe he took the hint, but he stood up at the same time as me and reached into his back pocket and pulled out his wallet. And he asked me, can I show you my daughter? I said, sure! And as he opened up his wallet, he began what you know you dads do. He turned into that besotted dad. He turned into something yet again. So he started explaining to me about this child, how old she was, and her best subjects in school, which essentially were all of them. Um, <laughs> how good she was at basketball and how much fun it was to play basketball with her and watch basketball with her when he got to visit her, which wasn't as often as he liked. But as he was talking, I was struck by this image of this girl, just dumbfounded. Curly, dark ringlets, hazel eyes, and skin just a few shades lighter than mine. And I remember stabbing my finger in his wallet, not probably my best move at that moment, 
and demanding to know, Red, you're going to have to explain this to me. He told me that he had been married to, his, to her mother, a black woman, and that as he continued his participation in the Klan, she was discontinuing his, her participation with him. And he loved her and couldn't hang on to her, and he was barely hanging on to his daughter. I remember when I got in the car that evening and driving home, just being like, just shaking my head. But I never forgot about Red. And I never forgot that p image of that smiling girl. Now, fast forward a couple of years later, and I um, took a leave of absence from this company to head off to Africa. Now, if I was going to tell the truth about this leave of absence, I was um, escaping, kind of like Dave Chappelle did, you know, the famous comedian who took off to Africa when things got to it. I, Dave Chappelle had a Lolita moment, because I did it years before, I'll tell you. What I was doing was avoiding a workforce reduction that was going to cut the headcount from 4,700 roughly to about 1,500 people. And I knew that I was going to have some administrative responsibilities for it, and I just didn't have it in me. Not again. Landing in Namibia, which is a country that had just blinked into existence at the end of apartheid, I met and quickly befriended uh, a fellow American, a woman named Sandy Chitendero, say that five times fast, and um, her husband, Mose. Dr. Chitendero uh, was deeply curious about my efforts in uh, racial reconciliation here in the United States, the diversity program and the affirmative action programs I'd worked on. He was trying to see if he could figure out a way to map on some of the things that I'd learned to his efforts in Namibia. Sandy and Mose were really generous in introducing me to people, and they introduced me to members of the government, including Dr. Libertina, who as, uh, let's see, regional and local minister of housing, amazing title. But this woman um, had calculated down to the last brick how much uh, building materials it took to transform a shack built from stuff found on the side of the road into a house that provided both dignity and shelter. When I listened to her in her office, I could see the future that she was talking about. Before I left, Dr. Chittendero made a request of me. He said this, give up your job. Don't hide out in corporate America. Now, at this point, I tried to beg off, saying, you know, Dr. Chittendero, I really don't know anything about starting or running a company, right? And he said, my dear, <laughs> before I was House Speaker, I was, a, I was a professor at a university. What did I know about starting and running a government? Yeah. I called long distance. It was probably the longest distance peace out in the history of this com company. But I did leave the company and asked to be put on the list of volunteers for the workforce reduction. I got that much of his message, but the rest of it was really hard for me to get my hands around about starting my company and contributing that way. The, there was something about Red and Dr. Chittendero that was really pretty similar. It was hard for me to kind of understand. There was Red, who was... Um, despite his protestations, a Klansman, a member of a white supremacist organization. And what Red wanted me to know was that white rights, including rights of people like him, deserved my protection. And then there was Dr. Chittendero, who was a noted statesman and politician who'd been at the effect of people like Red all of his life, who did say, yes, it matters that my country work for everyone, including people like Red, but he also wanted to know, me to know that my ability to contribute inside corporate America the way I was working was being constrained. But the truth is, I really wasn't listening to either man. There was something going on between me and being able to listen deeply and authentically to what either of the men, men were saying. And it took me years of study and exploration to figure out what was going on. What I figured out is that I had been bumping up against two broad, common, listening barriers that tend to run us all in conversations, and that's listening for agreement and listening for threat. Now, when we listen for agreement, we're also listening for its corollaries, like, I like it, I think it's entertaining or impressive, 
or it's consistent with everything I already know and feel and believe. Because it makes it really kind of difficult, I'll speak for myself, to listen to people who don't have the right outfits, the right titles, the right degrees, the right opinions, and the right theories. What ends up happening is that there's this kind of cerebral construct called I or me or the self that's riding along it, where are my Trekkies at? In the, what, the Crystalline Alien in Star Trek Next Generation episode, uh, season one, episode 18, Home Soil. <laughs> and if you know it, say it after me, in your ugly bag of mostly water. So inside there, there's this running commentary going on about the world and everything in it. Now, what I'm gonna do right now is give you just a moment so that you can listen in to the voice of your own personal commentator. It is the voice asking, what the hell voice is this woman asking about? <laughs> or insisting that your bag of mostly water isn't ugly at all. <laughs> and if we put all of that commentary on speakerphone right now, there is nothing that poor Caleb back there on the sound console could do with my mic that would make it remotely possible for you to hear me above all the noise. But that is what's going on in our conversations with one another. We listen politely. We pay attention. But we know that we're really plotting our escape, or we're just surviving, right? Or we're planning our rebuttal. We do, in conversations, what my friend Kim calls making cow noises. Let me demonstrate that for you now. Mmm. Mmm. -mm. And then when it's really fine, mmm, mmm, mmm. But are we listening? Not hardly, not to the person talking. We are dialed in to our own personal serious radio station where we're the DJ, and we're every person on every band, on every record, and we're the listening public. Now, let's talk about the other one, and that's listening for threat. That was not as much fun to talk about, and I think when people do talk about this particular phenomenon, it's all in the abstract. Because it involves some other structures in the human brain. Everybody had beautiful AV material. This is it, the puppet show, it starts now. This is your brain, this is your limbic system, and deep inside that is this ancient little nugget of nervous tissue called the amygdala, and all it's doing is scanning for threats. Kill me and eat me. You guys are too far back, I'm not worried about you. <laughs> Kill me and eat me, you look like a nice lady, I'm not worried about you either. Kill me and eat me, the guy with the camera, oh dear God. And when, <laughs> and when it gets triggered, it sends out this, biochemical cascade that alters our perception, that alters our thinking, and that alters our physiology. Now let's head back to the catbird seat for those earlier conversations I was just telling you about. Because it's really easy to see that when Red said, Klansmen, it's really easy to see that I was triggered, right? I'd stop listening because my lid was flipped. What's not quite as easy to see is that when Dr. Chittendero suggested that I quit my job, that I was just as lid flipped. I was sitting there politely drinking my tea and making cow noises as appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> but my internal monologue, I don't even know that I can actually put that on speakerphone for you right now. Part of it started off, I think, like this. Is this black man crazy? And then it went on from there, right? <laughs> I was, and I had these body sensations, like my ears felt like they were climbing up, and my skin was hot and tight, and I was breathing faster and sh more shallowly, and my heart was racing. The thing is that the conversation with the, the statesman had elicited almost the same response as the conversation with the Klansmen. Go figure. Now, it took me a while to go back to, and study and figure out, like, what was happening? Like, what happened that had me not be able to listen to them in the moment? 
because I wanted to go back and unpack their contributions to me and really get it. Now, researchers have been looking at the area of listening in these two broad listening phenomena for quite some time and their impacts on um, individuals and organizations and families. And what they found is that, um, and this is a researcher named Dr. Harville Hendricks, brilliant man. He's found from his research that if you do one of two common things, very simple, that you can lessen the seizure of the hijack and get people back on track to thinking. Simple as it, as it can be, and that is to mirror back what the other person is saying, just simply to repeat it back to them word for word. Or, if you can't do that, to give them a good summary of what they just said. For the listener, it makes it really hard for your agreement machine to be running riot or for you, for you to be tuning in your own serious radio station if you know that you have to repeat back to that person word for word what they just said. For the speaker, though, it gives them the sense of, you know, what's that commercial that's on right now with the woman, the actress, walking around like she's invisible? Do you know what I'm talking about? That that can create almost an existential crisis for people. And so by hearing your words coming back to you, it can start to calm your mind long enough for the two of you to get back into a full conversation. Now, I think that people like Dr. Chittendero, excuse me, the late Dr. Chittendero, I think he was a master at listening and managing his own limbic abductions. He knew that to have a country that worked for everyone, he had to get the contributions of everyone no matter how inartfully they were made. If I was gonna leave you with a takeaway from this conversation I'm having with you, I think it's this. Transforming our relationship to science or economics, ourselves, even things like justice, may require that we go beyond the easy listening of agreement and threat. We may have to learn to squint with our ears to really hear what people are saying by listening more deeply and completely that next conversation that could transform our relationship to, um, to organizations and institutions, that next conversation that could um, spur us to new levels of performance and connection, literally new futures, maybe with someone we might never stop long enough to listen to. Imagine. Thanks for listening.